out here and I looked at it and I go, boy, that is a lot of stuff to cover tonight. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see how much we can get done here. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my story. First of all, I was a youngster growing up in a uh, beautiful state of Montana. Anybody here from Montana? No, just okay. We one, two. <laughs> That's almost the state population. <laughs> it's the only state in the Union where there are more cattle than people. But uh, I had a lot of fun going out uh, along the Bighorn River and uh, in the dinosaur beds located on the Campbell Wheat Corporation out there. And uh, we would find lots of marine fossils and lots of dinosaur fossils. And uh, of course the bug bit me at a young, young age and uh, I've been involved with geology for, yeah, I can't remember how many years, but it's, it's been a long, long, long time. And seen a, a lot of changes. I was trained in secular geology. And uh, during my school years, my mother was the uh, county librarian of Bighorn County. And uh, we had one of those old Carnegie libraries. Uh, some of you who are around my age might remember those big red brick square buildings where the the heat would bang in the pipes and had the smell of old books. Just a wonderful place to hang out. And that's what, what I did. That's what I did with a lot of my time. And I read just about every book I could on geology, dinosaurs, paleontology, and um, there were some things that were beginning to shift in my mind. I didn't really know what was happening at the time. I was also raised in a very uh, wonderful family, uh, six of us kids, and um, uh, I was raised in a very strong Catholic family, and the nuns did a good job of telling me the stories of uh, Noah's flood and Adam and Eve, David. I believed all of those stories as a young kid. Well, during my grade school years and into junior high, began to shift in my thinking and question all of those stories. And that questioning really came from the amount of material I was digesting from the secular viewpoint and did not see that what was really going on. By the time I got into high school, um, I pretty much had given up on any kind of religion, went off to college, went to a very liberal university uh, the University of Kansas, known really for basketball, music, and drugs in uh, probably that order. <laughs> but I went to school there, and uh, while I was there, during my senior year of college, I became a believer. Now, isn't that something, going to a liberal university and becoming a Christian? And uh, when I became a Christian, of course, I believed the miracle of the resurrection. And it suddenly dawned on me, I've got a problem. I believe this miracle about Jesus rising from the dead, and that's in the New Testament. But how come I'm having such a problem believing simple story in the Old Testament about the flood and, and the creation? And I realized at that point I needed to get some things straightened out. So the first book that was given to me uh, was a book called The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris. And uh, I still think I have one of the original copies uh, that came out. And that book initially, reading through that, I became very, very angry because I could see that in my secular instruction, there was a lot of material that was being left out. Now, as a uh, as an open scientist, as what I thought I was, why would they leave material out that could influence my view of the rocks and the earth? And uh, then began to just put some things together and began to see that we're really not dealing with a science issue here. We're dealing with a philosophical issue. And uh, I've been working on that now uh, ever since. Uh, I've kind of decided to come in through the back door and this whole issue with uh, kids and families. The frontal assault does not work anymore. We used to do that in the 70s and the 80s, and the evolutionists used to just kind of consider us to kind of be gnats, you know, kind of in the way and bothersome. But uh, today, of course, they don't tolerate that. And that was the frontal assault. Now, 
we go through the back door and we want to educate these kids and getting, getting, uh, getting them equipped with the right view of things, how to think about things, how to reason through things, and how to look at the structure of the earth and apply the biblical view to it. And uh, so I have contact with probably 800 to 1,000 kids every year, and um, that hopefully will pay off here someday and don't have to do the frontal assault thing anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that was, those are the days when we had the debates. I don't know if some of you might remember those. We used to schedule those debates on college campuses and then watch the guys go at it, you know. Uh, but things are just a little bit different today. Anyway, uh, that's a little bit of my story. Uh, and um, it kind of gives you an idea, maybe a little bit of the background that I'm going to tackle tonight. So let's tackle this. Um, geology is the key to unraveling earth history. Did you know geology is the biggest division point in the church today? The biggest dividing points in the church today are not frogged prints. Most people think that's such a stupid idea anyway. What people really are divided over in the church today is the age of the earth and whether there was a global flood that laid down all the fossils. Frankly, it's a war about what God has said in Genesis. And uh, that is the biggest dividing point. It's in the area of geology, not biology, and not even astronomy. It's in geology. And that was the biggest dividing point in the 1800s as well. And we'll look at a little bit of that tonight. So we have a conflict here. Modern geology declares emphatically that the earth is 4.6 billion years old. Not many people realize that that has undergone an evolution in the last 200 years. In the 1700s, the cutting edge of evolutionary thinking, we'll call it evolutionary thinking, although it, it, it wasn't as set as it was in Darwin's day, the age of the earth, this whole battle was really being formed by the French scientists, and the age of the earth then was set at an ungodly 75,000 years old. Can you imagine that? That's how old these French atheists thought the earth was, 75,000 years old. And uh, then that spread to several hundred million years uh, in the early 1800s. And in the early part of the 20th century, some guy was fooling around with the newly discovered radioactivity and decided that we could measure the age of the Earth by measuring the decay of uranium. And he came up with a, another ungodly age of the Earth of one billion years old. And then finally, in the 1950s, by measuring the radioactive decay of meteorites, the Earth was declared to be 4.6 billion years old, and that's where it sits today. Now, if you look at that and you go, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. If we're dealing about science here in an exact way, I mean, that's what science is. It's really observation, repeatable experiments, and so on. Those things that didn't work were thrown out as non-science. Pasteur uh, found that out. Several scientists found that out. So, okay, so we're declaring the Earth to be 4.6 billion years old. Where is really the science in it? We'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. The conflict here is that the scripture declares the earth to be about 6,000 years old. You can figure that out very simply from the chronologies in the Old Testament. Now, here is the influence of modern geology. Now, I say modern geology because the geologists of the 1700s, 16 1700s, were not the geologists of the 1800s, and in fact, the geology of the 1800s was called the new geology. And that was uh, really in opposition to the old geology, which was based on the flood and the creation. Now, the influence here, a lot of people think the main, uh, the, the, the main conflict here is with Darwinism. But Darwin came several years after evolutionary geology was thoroughly set in place. Now, the influence was here. Of course, you recognize this fellow. This is uh, Darwin and the ship, the, the Beagle. 
And uh, when he went on board, the captain of the ship gave him this newly published book uh, called The Principles of Geology by Charles Lyell. And uh, Darwin read this book, and this became the foundation for his evolutionary biology. And in fact, what was being taught in the principles of geology was the idea that great lengths of time were required to shape and form the earth, certainly much longer than what the Bible had to say. And this opened the eyes of Darwin. This, is, this was his enlightenment right here. And this was the mechanism he was looking for to really give uh, a foundation to evolutionary biology, the changes in the different species and so on that he thought he saw, over great deals of time, these creatures could change into brand new creatures. This was where it began, right here. Now, <clears throat> geology really involves two parts. It's the study of the earth. It's what the word means, but it involves two parts. It involves certainly science. It involves the physical chemistry of the earth. That's the science. It's amazing when I talk with other geologists about rock forming or, or rock um, uh, content and identifying rocks. No difference when we talk about identifying metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and so on. It's complete agreement way down the line. We can look under a microscope and see the crystal formations, agree, have a good time, and so on. But then when we start talking about the formation of those rocks, all of a sudden we're at the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And that's because the origin of the earth is another part of geology that's taught, involves its physical history, but this is philosophy or history. Now, the problem here is that modern geology teaches this as a science package. This is a package deal that you learn. They do not take the time to sort it out. This is the way it is. This is science. It's a complete package. It would help us a lot if they separated this two, these two things. If we learned the science and then we went down the hall and sat in the history or philosophy class, but it's not. This is what freshmen learn the very first class they take in geology. And this is the way it is. And this is very deceptive, and it's very misleading, and this is what begins to throw off a Christian's faith. I've talked to hundreds of college students. I used to have a ministry on college years ago. In fact, I was at the University of Indiana, spent several years there, and I remember one fellow who had gone to a Christian college not far away, and uh, spent a semester there. <clears throat> he, he was a believer. He spent a semester there and then came to Indiana University. Why? To get his faith sorted out. And I ran into him and I spent almost every day with him for almost a semester. That's how long it took to get his faith worked out and correct some of the massive problems that came as a result of being educated with a Christian view but a secular explanation of the earth. And those two will destroy a person's faith. That's just the way it is. Modern geology is taught as this kind of a package. Now, modern geology does claim to solve the issues of the origins uh, of the earth through unbiased scientific research. Today, it's primarily uh, in the field of radiometric dating of volcanic rocks. But the history of modern geology tells a completely different story. And this is a story that's not often covered in, uh, and it wasn't covered in any of the college classes I took, and it's certainly not covered today. And in fact, uh, I have run into very few believers that know the history of modern geology. It's crucial to understanding this whole uh, conflict between the age of the earth, for instance, and uh, well, you know, what, what secular scientists teach about it and what the scriptures teach about it. Now, let's begin here. We want to look at three figures that were very important in history. Of course, you all recognize Isaac Newton. Um, 
He's, uh, he's known for his hairdo. <laughs> I want you to notice the dates on, on these fellows and some of the things we're going to look at here first. So this is the 1600s, correct? Now, <clears throat> Newton, of course, was a brilliant astronomer, physicist, mathematician. Today, he's probably considered the greatest scientist who ever lived. It's interesting. You know what Newton was known for during his day? As a theologian. Newton had the largest theology library in Europe. And he was a master at history, and he was a master at, at theology. This is what he was known for then. Today we know him as probably the greatest scientist who ever lived. Of course, you recognize this guy, uh, Kepler. Again, notice the dates, brilliant astronomer and mathematician. And then there's Galileo, uh, also a brilliant uh, astronomer and mathematician. Now, these were all brilliant men who believed and taught that the Earth was about 6,000 years old and that there had been a global catastrophic flood in Earth's past. Here's a character that you probably uh, have not heard of unless you've taken geology. This guy's name is Nicholas Steno. Now, he was a Danish anatomist and geologist. Notice the dates, by the way. In his work, Prodromus, 1669, he taught that the Earth was 6,000 years old. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that the organic fossils in the sedimentary strata were laid down by Noah's flood. And he set forth a set of principles for interpreting the rock record that are still in use today. In fact, these are the principles I learned as a young geologist. The principles of steno. And we're going to cover a few of those tonight as we look at things. He's called the father of stratigraphy. Now, when I studied Steno, I didn't see this picture. I probably would have rebelled had I seen this picture. And I didn't want some religious man teaching me about geology anyway. So I didn't have a good picture of Steno. And he certainly, the, the teacher, never taught me about his views on the age of the earth. Otherwise, I probably would have rebelled against his set of uh, stratigraphic principles. Stratigraphy, by the way, is just kind of a, it's really the science of reading the strata and positioning the strata. That's what that is. Now, here is a, uh, a godless article from Encyclopedia Britannica, 1771. Now, under the heading of astronomy, features a table of historical events and their dates. The article treats these events as actual historical events and times. Notice the first event that they list. <laughs> the creation. And when did it start? Year zero. <laughs> Years to Christ, 4,007. Then the next important event on the list was the deluge. That was the fancy word they used back then for the flood. Noah's flood. Notice the year. Uh, then, of course, the various empires that came next. Isn't that interesting? Today, uh, ancient history starts way before the creation. I don't know if you've noticed that. The Egyptian, uh, of course, the, the Egyptian history now is kind of the gold standard of ancient history. And, of course, it's supposed to have started way back uh, five, ten thousand years ago. Well, that's before the creation. How can we have that going on? And uh, but here you can see Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, I think this is before the ACLU got a hold of them, but uh, there you have it, 1771. Now, in the same encyclopedia, notice this next one. Under the heading of deluge, they have a plate of Noah's Ark. And they said, uh, Noah's flood, which overflowed and destroyed the whole earth, and out of which only Noah and those with him in the ark escaped. Uh, this is all, well, you can take this right out of Genesis, you see. I mean, there it is. Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, <laughs> amazing, isn't it? Before the 1700s, most scientists believe the scriptures to be God's historical revelation about the beginning of the earth and its destruction by a global catastrophic flood. Now, these guys realized 
it might have been unspoken, but they realized that certain things about the past history of the earth have to be revealed. You cannot discover those through any kind of principles. That's past history. It has to really be revealed, unless there's somebody, of course, who has seen it and left a detailed eyewitness account. So here's the question then. What caused the shift in thinking between the 1700s and modern geology? Was it scientific discovery? No, it's really a period called the Enlightenment. Again, we don't study this much anymore. I ask an average uh, school child these days, tell me about the Enlightenment, and they can't do it. Um, it is, I know when I was a kid, of course, uh, history bored me. I didn't like memorizing dates and didn't like memorizing people's names that were disconnected. They had nothing to do with each other. Columbus who? You know, he, we celebrated him because he was on, he discovered America on my birthday. <laughs> and the banks would close, the post office would close, on the 12th of October. Of course, when they shifted that, I lost direction in life. Now we don't do that. But you see, these are, these are histor history just was a bore to me until I became a believer and began to see that history is connected. All these events and people and dates and things, they're connected. There's something massive going on behind all of this stuff. And the Enlightenment was one of these major events in our history. First of all, the Enlightenment was a period of history in Western civilization during which ideas about God began to radically depart from the scripture. The Enlightenment gave us the religion of deism. That's really a in-between step from atheism or from theism to atheism, which we all enjoy today. People are proud to be atheists today. Well, in the 1800s, people were proud to be deists. That was a very comfortable place to be. You weren't an atheist, and you weren't really theist. But you were respected in the community, and you did believe that there was a God. That's what deism is. But deism is this religion, the idea that God probably existed and probably created the universe, but that he is a way and irrelevant to understanding the history of the earth. The Enlightenment gave us the new geology, as it was called. That is that the earth's present geologic processes that we can observe now shaped the earth over millions of years of slow and gradual erosion and deposition, uh, that there was no global flood of Genesis. And the Enlightenment gave us a general denial of miracles, like the virgin birth and the resurrection. Even the, the heresies that came out of the late 1800s were really due to evolutionary geology. Now, biology managed to just kind of put the icing on the cake, but it was evolutionary geology that really kicked all of this stuff uh, into high gear is the idea that God was away or not involved in his earth, then miracles just simply do not exist. Everything must be explained by science to be valid. Now, you've heard that before, but this is where it comes from. Now, from the uh, Pelican history of the church, uh, we read this. It says, the deists, since they increasingly question the reality, even the possibility of revelation or the scriptures, denied the sufficiency of the proofs advanced to support it. The issue at stake was the historical proof of the genuineness of the Christian records. God himself was expected to produce credentials satisfactory to human reason. That, in a nutshell, uh, capsulizes what was going on in the 1800s. Now, this view was held by uh, <coughs> a minority, at the time, it was really a kind of an elitist view, but they were the movers and the shakers that determined the directions that universities were taking, the seminaries began to take, and that the, uh, the, the prestigious science institutions were taking of the day. What shifted in Western civilization was a philosophical outlook, not scientific evidence. 
And see, what I was taught in geology was that these things happen as an enlightenment, that's what they call an enlightenment, to free us from the shackles of bigotry and religion. That's what I was taught. And quite the contrary, the enlightenment is really more appropriately called the endarkenment. I mean, that's what really happened. Now, it was really a garden event. And the issue at stake was, indeed, did God say? That is, to me, the issue. I notice there are churches today that have kind of two sides in their church. They want to bring people together. They have one side that are convinced in a young earth. They have another side that are not sure about things, and they let this rest. Well, really, there, there, is a, there is another area that I think everybody can agree on as Christians. We part of Orthodox Christianity, and that is the Bible, all of the Bible, every word in the Bible is God's word. And that is really the issue. Are we going to take that and apply it, or are we going to pick it apart? And that, that is the garden event. That's what happened even in Genesis 3. It picked apart what God had said. And by listening to the lies, of course, it set history on a not so good course. Now, we have got to see this as the war that's going on. This is a must see. The issue is, um, thanks. The issue is really not science. This is the one that just smacked me right in the face after I became a believer. I was going to this liberal university, uh, and uh, it, 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 that's what hit me. This is not a science thing. You could have tons of scientific evidence for both sides. In fact, really, the person with the most evidence wins. I mean, that's kind of the way the debates work. It's, how I form my opinions about debates. You just need to run into somebody that's got more evidence than you do. And phew, there's the truth until the next guy comes along. It's not science. The issue is that we, we have got to see this. It is a war. It's a philosophical war. It's a spiritual war that's going on. Now, modern geology really began with this man, James Hutton, 1700s. In fact, he's called the father of modern geology, so uh, we need to pay attention to him. If he's the father of modern geology, then everything that we are studying today really began with him. Forget Isaac Newton, forget Steno, forget all these other guys. This is what we concentrate on here. So James Hutton. Now James Hutton was a Scottish physician and uh, he's described as a great observer of the world. How many of us are great observers of the world? I classify myself that, that way. Uh, every, every place we go, my wife drives, and I have half a dozen buckets in the back of the car. And we stop all along where we're going and coming back, and I collect evidence from the earth. <laughs> Now, she has been married. By the way, we're, selling, we're celebrating our 33rd anniversary today. And uh, <laughs> she has hung in there with me all this time. She just, she just keeps saying, oh, so long as you can make a living from it, I don't mind it being here. <laughs> so uh, James Hutton was a self-proclaimed deist. He taught that the past history of the earth could be, and must be, he insisted on it, explained in terms of natural geologic processes called uniformitarianism. Hutton's view of earth history was cyclical. He denied global flood as taught in Genesis. Now, some of you may recognize this next diagram. In fact, some of you parents have probably taught your kids this in earth science, right? How many of you parents, I, I don't want to embarrass you, but how many of you learned the rock cycle as a part of earth science? Any of you study this, the rock cycle? Some of you have, some of you brave souls are raising your hands here. Yes, yeah, this is, the, believers know the rock cycle when they study earth science. It's taught to them as a fact of science. But look at it real closely. Where's the beginning? <coughs> It just goes around and around in a circle. Stuff gets recycled. It's a, the earth is a huge recycling machine. 
And in fact, this is what Hutton said. He could see no vestiges of a beginning, nor prospect of an end. There's no room for a creator here, and certainly no room for a flood. I do not teach the rock cycle anymore. I don't. I used to, and I thought, you know what? We haven't observed three-fourths of what's on this chart. <laughs> I'm going to stop teaching it. It's not a scientific principle. It's a statement of belief is what it is. No one's ever observed this. We've observed volcanic rocks form. No geologist has ever observed uh, the granitic rocks forming. In fact, every time they melt uh, rhyolite lava, which is, has the same elements in it as granite, they get rhyolite lava. <laughs> and every time they melt granite, they get Rhyolite lava. They don't get granite. No one's ever seen metamorphic rocks form. It's a guess. It's a belief. But it's taught as fact. And this stuff goes in our heads. We churn it around. It comes from the white coats. And so it must be true. And that's what we teach. And that's what infects uh, thinking. Now, perhaps the most influential man in geology was this guy, Charles Lyell. He was a British attorney, a master with words. <laughs> Both he and Hutton were not geologists. They were great observers of the earth. There were no magnificent rock collections or fossil collections or museums with dinosaur bones and things like that during this period. There were weirdos who collected fossils and things like that, but they were more oddities than anything else. In fact, there was no paleontology. There was no geology. There was no uh, archaeology. There were none of the historical sciences that we teach today. It was natural philosophy. That's what it was called. And uh, whatever that included wasn't even, had, didn't even have much definition to it. But Charles Lyell thought that the Earth must be hundreds of millions of years old. And he popularized, he took Hutton's idea of uniformitarianism, and he popularized it by a simple slogan. And that slogan was this, the present is the key to the past. See how easy that is to remember? The present is the key to the past. In other words, what we observe happening now can explain everything that's gone on in the past. Well, what happens if you embrace that? Can you hold on to the flood? Well, tell, show me where a global flood has taken place today. It has not. We see localized things, but no one's ever witnessed a global flood except Noah and his family. So the present cannot be the key to the past. It's actually, revelation is the key to the past. If you find out, want to find out about the past that you did not observe and record, it must be revealed to you, or you must guess at it. Now, this saying, the present is the key to the past, is a statement of belief or philosophy. It is not a statement about scientific proof. And this is the way it was taught to me. Uniformitarianism was this freedom from the shackles of religion. And that's the way it was taught to me. Now, Charles Lyell was a self-proclaimed deist. He set about to collect evidence against the idea of the global flood of Genesis. Now, I didn't know this about Lyell. I was taught about him. But here's what I didn't notice, uh, know about him. He had a personal goal. And his goal was to eliminate any influence from Genesis on the study of geology. That's a real open-minded approach, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that was his personal goal. But this was never taught to me. I was always taught that he was a brave, courageous man who stood in the face of the church to demonstrate that the hypocrisy and the bigotry and the myth of modern day religion. That's the way I was taught. And that's really how it's presented. By the way, Charles Lyell is really the hero in modern geology. Now, Charles Lyell visited Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is one of the major excuses for abandoning biblical chronology. Some of you might have been influenced by this. I was as a kid. The story of Niagara Falls and how old it was. This influenced my unbelief. 
Now, in 1841, Lyell noticed that the gorge cut through elevated tableland approximately 35,000 feet. That's science, isn't it? You can measure that. Lyell observed the erosive processes taking place. When he returned to England, he published his findings. He declared that Niagara Falls was 35,000 years old, much older than the Bible's chronology would allow. Now, Lyell did not give any reason why he chose this rate of erosion. That would be one foot per year, right? But it had its desired effect of eroding confidence in the biblical flood, and that's what eroded my confidence in the Bible. That's one of the stories that I heard and read. Now, <clears throat> here's what Lyell left out. And again, I wasn't taught this either. The underlying rock in Niagara Falls is shale and limestone. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls? Anybody? It's really a marvelous place, fantastic place. The rock there is always crashing down. And it's because it's made of shale, which is a very soft sedimentary rock, and limestone. Now, limestone can be easily uh, eroded due to acidity. The city has a big uh, effect uh, on limestone. Now, the various reports of different rates of erosion had been around during this time. Uh, I don't know whether Lyle knew them or not. He didn't give any reasons for why he chose them. But in 1829, the falls had re been reported receding three feet a year uh, over 40 years. That was observed, which, of course, if you use uniformitarian assumptions, that would make the gorge how old? Well, 12,000 years old. Now, later reports surfaced from 1842 to 1927 measured a high rate of erosion, four to five feet per year, making the gorge roughly 7,000 years old. When all the factors that affect erosion are considered, the age of the gorge would fit within a biblical view. But these options weren't presented to the public in England. Very few people had the, uh, the ability or the privilege to travel to Niagara Falls and do the research. Lyell did it for him. Now here's the lesson. The age of the earth cannot be calculated based on what is happening now. It must either be guessed at based on a worldview or it must be revealed. Which one of those erosive rates are you going to choose as the one that carved the gorge in past history? See, you can come up with any answer you want because the present is the key to the past. Uniformitarianism claims to be the true revealer of Earth history with its naturalistic processes. The scriptures claim to be the revelation from God that has revealed the age of the earth as well as historical global flood. Now, that's the war. Let me give you a reason for it. And it's not science. This is by a world famous geneticist who said we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant provinces of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations. No matter how counterintuitive no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. That is the reason we have the war. It's not 
Bible thumpers. It's, it's a philosophy that is contrary to the scriptures. That's the whole reason we have the war. Now, how has the philosophy of uniformitarianism shaped the last 200 years of science? Well, number one, it's eroded the trust in the scriptures. And two, it has created a false science, which is modern geology. Let me give you some examples here. In 1869, this man, John Wesley Powell, a very courageous man, he'd lost his arm in the Civil War. He was a geologist. He'd been educated in a uniformitarian view. And he uh, floated down the um, Colorado River. He did it a couple of times, two or three times. Almost lost his life on one of those. His desire was to map the Colorado River and to explain the formation of the Grand Canyon. And uh, somehow, through processes that he had figured out, he came up with an age of the formation of the Grand Canyon at 70 million years. Now, that date was taught, that age was taught for 60 years as fact. Well, it, <clears throat> this is interesting. The formation of the Grand Canyon has been one of the major mysteries in geology even today. Behind closed doors, they argue about this. Now, they present it to the public as a solved issue, but it's far from solved. And uh, here's, here's some, here are some examples. The, the dating of the Grand Canyon really has been all over the geologic map. Recent dating method came up with five to six million years for the formation of the Grand Canyon. Some dating methods produced 17 million years. The western and central portions have been dated at 55 to 65 million years old. The uh, more accurate dating of lavas using radioactive dating came up with four separate dating methods that yield ages for the formation of the Grand Canyon all the way from 400 million years to 2.5 billion years. Science Magazine announced in 2012 the formation of the Grand Canyon took place 40 million years ago. Now, I want to throw something in the hopper here. What about the global flood of 4,500 years ago, since we're talking about variable ages here? Well, I think the global flood can adequately explain it. We'll touch on it here in a little bit. The age of the Grand Canyon formation has really been as a result of guessing versus revelation. And meanwhile, millions of people's faith has been destroyed by this. This is what we need to see, the importance of this. It's so silent, but it's a deadly silence. So how has the philosophy of uniformitarianism shaped the last 200 years of science? The entire radiometric dating system has been developed based on uniformitarian principles. Present rates of radioactive decay are extrapolated into the past to give long ages. Let me just say this too, that unless there can be a proper grasp of radiometric dating and what really goes on into it, I believe it is the Achilles heel of Christianity. Now, <clears throat> That's because I don't think it's ever taught. I have a habit of grabbing the latest college textbook on geology when I can, just to see what's being taught. And immediately I turn to the section on radiometric dating. They all cover it. Not once do they mention anything to do with assumptions that are made in radiometric dating. Not once. They assume and deal with it as if it were fact of science. And a lot of people look at that, and that's where the faith gets destroyed. And that's why I think you have a lot of the church splitting. And you got some saying, well, the age of the earth has been proven to be 4.6 billion years, so that we can't take Genesis literally. The other side is saying, wait a minute, there's a few other things here to consider. And then we're labeled as religious fanatics. The problem is that there's not a whole lot of science in radiometric dating. And if we don't grasp that, uh, th that can be the Achilles heel of faith. So it's awfully important. I just finished um, getting my book bound and printed here on bedrock geology out here on the, the table. It's really meant for grades 5 through 12. <coughs> but it has a section in it 
uh, on radiometric dating. And I think kids can grasp this if they see what's going on. And this, this is really to help them. Okay, so millions of people's faith has then been destroyed. How has the philosophy of uniformitarianism shaped the last 200 years of science? Let's go back to our man named Nicholas Steno and uh, father of stratigraphy. He came up with several laws or principles. One of these is the law of superposition. And it says this, in any given undisturbed set of rock layers, the rocks on the bottom were laid down before the ones on top. <laughs> Actually, it's really quite profound when you think about it. <laughs> so what does the law of superposi superposition describe? It describes the relative position of rock layers. I can look at a set of rock layers and say, well, because of steno, that layer down there on the bottom was, came first, then the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. It doesn't tell me at all how old it is. It does tell me the relative positioning. It makes a lot of sense. Steno is a brilliant guy. <laughs> now let's take a look at rock layers in the Grand Canyon. You take a look at these layers, and there you see oldest. Well, let's start at the top. There's the newest, then older, 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 and older. Called the oldest down there at the bottom. I, I, okay, I understand that. And then you see a kind of a drawing of those layers. Does everybody grasp the law of superposition here? <laughs> it's, it's really quite interesting. Okay, the law of superposition. That's a statement about relative timing of the deposition and position of the rock layers, not about the age of the rocks. And yet that is misconstrued in modern geology today. The law of superposition tells me that these rock layers are old. Wait a minute, it does no such thing. It tells me the relative position of the rock layers. Now, what if we add some fossils to the mix? Let's say we have some marine creatures on the bottom layers, and we have some land vertebrates on the top. Well, finding fossils of sea creatures on the bottom of the rock layers and land animals on the top does not tell me how old the rock layers are, does it? No, it tells me in what order they were buried. That's the law of superposition. It's really quite simple when we grasp onto it. Now, one's world view has to, to determine how old the layers are. Because I can look at those rock layers and say, well, wow, those were all laid down relatively quickly during a one-year period known as the Genesis Flood and I would be barred from getting a science degree. The others can say, no, these were laid down over hundreds of millions of years. Well, wait a minute. How did you determine that? Well, <clears throat> some people then will ask me, well, what about radiometric dating? Hasn't that confirmed that these rock layers are old? Well, no, the idea of an old Earth was set in geology long before radioactivity was even discovered, betraying the assumption of an old earth. This geog uh, the geologic timetable, except for the years, was set way back in the 1800s, early 1800s. Radioactivity was discovered when? Some of you engineers, <laughs> about 1897. So what, almost 60 years after uh, Lyell wrote his book. Science can attempt to classify or identify the fossils and the rocks within the layers. But it cannot tell the history of the series of rock layers. One's interpretation of what he or she sees will depend on what they believe about the origin of those rocks and fossils. Now, let's go to the Grand Canyon, back to the Grand Canyon here. That is the icon of modern evolutionary geology. It really is. This is the flagship that you study. Now, there's a problem in the Grand Canyon. All geologists recognize it, and that is the persistence of unconformities. And what's an unconformity? You know, I think part of the problem in, in learning geology is it's really an intimidating subject because you've got all this language that you've got to learn. It's like learning a foreign language. 
and, and once you learn that, of course, now you understand the, the language of the priest and you can dialogue and hobnob and so on. But it really is kind of a secret language and you've got to learn it. So the unconformities, well, what are those? An unconformity, now this is a, a quotation from a, a, ge a geology textbook. This is standard stuff here. I put in a few emphases myself, so this isn't part of the textbook, but it says an unconformity is a buried erosional or non-depositional surface separating two rock masses or strata of different ages. Uh, that would be more my first question would come in. Indicating that sediment deposition was not continuous. In general, the older layer was exposed to erosion for an interval of time before deposition of the younger layer. But the term is used to describe any break in the sedimentary geologic record. Let's go to a, a formation here in the Grand Canyon. You see two different rock layers here. Now, there are two unconformities here. One is at the bottom, and the one is in separating the uh, shale from the sandstone. You see them there? And, and they're flat. They're flat contacts. Unconformities, then, these would be breaks in the rock layers where millions of years of time are supposed to be missing. Now, I would never know it. It's like... They're, they're flat. They're, they're, they're flat against each other. What I should see is, is all of the geology that took place in that missing time. Something has got to be recorded, but it's not. It's just one right on top of another. So when I look at the rock layers, and this was quite a revelation for me, there were no dates or ages stamped on the formation. I was a, young, a youngster, maybe in junior high, I was out collecting fossils and I picked one up and all of a sudden, it was like a lightning bolt hit me. There's no, there's no date stamped on this. <laughs> and I found myself, I had to run back to my book to see how old it was. And it never dawned on me at the time, later on I put it together, I shouldn't have to do that. I mean, I can pull, I, you know, I collect some silver dollars here and there, I love them. Uh, but you can pull a silver dollar out of your pocket and you can tell exactly when it was made and where it was minted. Because there's a date stamped on it. Now, if it didn't have any date stamped on it, you'd have to do a lot of work to try to see how old this thing was. Well, missing time or events due to either no deposition of sediments or complete erosion of sediments during the time in question is a matter of faith. In other words, I have to be taught that time is missing there. Because when I look at those rock layers, they look like they were laid right on top of each other relatively quickly without much disturbance at all. That's what superposition would tell me. Now, let's look at another formation here. Number one here, we've got uh, uh, three sets of rock layers. They're all different. Have a, uh, you have an unconformity between the first and the second group and a second conformity, uh, an unconformity between the second and the third group of rocks. Now, the superposition would tell me that, well, the first layer to be laid down was the one on the bottom. The second one to be laid down was the one in the middle. And the third to be laid down was the one on top. And then I go to my geology book and it tells me that the rocks on the bottom are one billion years old. The rocks in between are 250 million years old. How much time is missing between those two? There's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot missing. And then the one on top is 100 million years old. How much time is missing there? That one's easy, isn't it? 150 million years is missing. Now, geologists will tell me then, this is how old these rock layers are, and then I, I raise my question, I'm a little on the rebellious side, I say, okay, wait a minute, wait, where did you come up with the ages of these rocks? Now, geologists, they go further, and they tell you that, well, first of all, if you look at the rock layers again, we find uh, no fossils in the, in the bottom rock layer. And we find marine fossils in the middle layer. 
and we find dinosaur bones in the top layer. Okay, well that still doesn't answer my question. How old are they? Well, now we go to evolution. That proves our point. Evolution took place over hundreds of millions of years, developing from the simple to the more complex, the simple marine creatures on the bottom and the more complex on top. Well, but those marine creatures are not simple creatures. They're very complex. The trilobite, for instance, had very complex eyes and very well-developed creature. Uh, that, you can't tell me that that is what to play. And besides, that's a philosophy. That's a statement of belief about those rock layers. Now, this was the 1800s view of the fossils. The reason why these rock layers are hundreds of millions of years old is because evolution is the only explanation for the simple to complex creatures that we find in the fossil record. And that was the only alternative after rejecting the flood. If the flood's not the explanation for these rock layers, you've only got one explanation left, and that's evolutionary biology. So how do you know that it took great amounts of time? Well, there are no fossils on the bottom. That's easy. We can see that. But a worldview has to determine the age of those rock layers. There's just no other way to do it. Okay, let's go on then to the next one. Now let's tell a different story. The flood lasted a little over a year, didn't it? During which time the first 150 days were quite traumatic in tearing up sediments and life and burying tons and tons of fossils all over the world settled out. This is probably when the rocks in the Grand Canyon were formed. Then the next 150 days of the flood were spent in the receding portion of the flood, tearing up again the, the sediments. Of, actually, they were not hardened. They were quite pliable, tearing up the sediments and moving them, depositing them again. That's probably when the Grand Canyon was cut during the receding portion of the flood. Now, in this particular picture we see, the bottom layer consists of schist. That is a metamorphic rock. I tell kids, you need to be very careful of that word. It's a metamorphic rock, and that makes sense. Metamorphosis could, be take, it could have taken place early stages of the flood. Uh, when lots and lots of rock masses would have moved together, created friction and heat that would have done partial melting in some cases. Schist is a metamorphic rock. That would make sense there are no fossils in it, and that would make sense it was on the bottom. The next layers really consist of various sedimentary rocks like shales, limestones, sandstones, and so on and they would have been laid over those basement rocks torn up in the initial stages of the flood. Very quickly, successively, one after another, and very catastrophically, all in a little over a year. Now, that's what Isaac Newton believed. I mean, he didn't probably have the technical stuff about it down, but he did believe that that's what took place. Now, in the Grand Canyon, the layers of the Grand Canyon have been studied scientifically, and we know exactly what each layer consists of. Some are limestone, some are sandstone, all sedimentary rocks, by the way, except the rocks on the bottom. They're more of the metamorphic in the granites and so on. Now, the layers in Grand Canyon look continuous and unbroken, mostly smooth and flat. That's what they look like. They literally look like that, just flat. I showed you a few of those, one right after another on top of each other. But geologists tell us that there are massive periods of time events missing between the layers. The rock layers of the Grand Canyon represent stages in evolution laid down over vast eons of time. Now that's the story. Now, geologists have identified nine unconformities in the Grand Canyon. Uh, there's one there at 10 million years missing, another one of 140 million years missing, and finally, the one that they call the Great Unconformity, is over a billion years missing. 
Well, what that means is that in the history of the Grand Canyon, there are 1.31 billion years of time missing out of the last 2 billion years. Now, that to me is a little unreasonable. It seems to me that it would just be more scientific just to see what you see and call it what it is. Rapidly laid down sediments over a short period of time. Most of the history, and this is the significance of this, most of the hi history of the earth is missing. We are asked to believe the word of man, secular geologist, and assume that it was actually there. If you look at the layers again, if there were vast amounts of time of erosion taking place, you'd expect to see it in the rock record. Lots and lots of canyons and something. Think about it. You know, I think one of the reasons why we let millions of years go by is because we can't comprehend it. I sat down once and took, I found some resource online. You can find anything online. But for this one resource that told me uh, approximately how many major geologic activities took place in the last 10 years. And I just began to multiply that out. And uh, how many uh, geologic events, massive events like tsunamis and earthquakes and volcanic eruption took place in the last million years then. It was over 140,000. In 70 million years, you know how many geologic events? Major geologic events. And today we can see they all leave their mark. A tsunami leaves its mark and it leaves its mark for many years after. And you can see the devastation. Uh, Yellowstone Park is a good example. Go to Yellowstone, you can see the effects of volcanism that probably happened during the flood. Tore the thing up, and it still shows it. Now, you should see some of this in the rock record, but you don't. You see flat uh, layers. Now, here's what geologists want us to believe. Secular geologists are actually wanting us to believe that missing time is a reality and either eroded away or was never deposited. It's a little unbelievable that nothing can be deposited in a million years, let alone 70 million years or 100 million years. That just seems unreasonable. Yet thereafter should be understood as the illustration on the right. There's the missing time. Would it not be more scientific to simply acknowledge that the layers, as illustrated in the picture on the right, were actually laid down that way in quick succession, in that in reality there is no missing time? It seems reasonable to me. There are numerous examples like this in modern geology. The average person rarely sees the discrepancy or the underlying influence. Unconformities, by the way, are the trade secret of modern geology. We go on our field trip to Yellowstone, and uh, we do it every August, take families through there. I point out uh, at least a half a dozen unconformities. That not that I see, but geologists tell me are there. And we look at those, and people look at them and go, huh, I never knew that. But that's what's taught. Dr. Michael Roos, in Saving Darwinism from the Darwinians, uh, said this, evolution is a religion and not a science at all. It might be best understood as a worldview, a way of thinking and making sense of the world around us. Some, such as Eugenie Scott, have called this worldview philosophical materialism, a religious claim of naturalism that holds that nature is all there is. There is no supernatural being who has ever interfered with the natural order of things. Surely, this is a religious claim regarding all of reality. Evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular worldview, a secular religion, a full-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. I am an ardent evolutionist and an ex-Christian, but I must admit that in this one complaint, the literalists are absolutely right. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. And guess what? Uniformitarianism is the religion that formed the foundation of this evolutionary biology and this evolutionary worldview. 
it came from geology. Since the 1700s, the church has allowed the scientific establishment to determine the meaning of scripture, and this is the problem. By a philosophical outlook masquerading as scientific evidence, we have allowed that. If you think about it, if you read the Old Testament, who had the authority to teach and dispense the scriptures? Who was it? Anybody tell me? In the Old Testament? It was the Levitical priests. They were given that job. Guess who has that in our day and age? It's the priests. It's us, believers. And we shy away from it because we don't understand science. And obviously, they're smarter than we are. But the priests have the job of interpreting and dispensing the scriptures. That is our job. Now, understanding the history and philosophy of modern geology will help us defend the gospel, which we're supposed to do. And this is a good verse I think about a lot from 2 Corinthians. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. What are those fortresses? We are destroying speculations, evolution, and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. Evolutionary geology is speculation raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. One last thought to leave you here. The war is not science versus religion. It is rebellion plus science versus the scriptures plus science. That is the warfare we're dealing with today. Thank you, Patrick. We, uh, we're going to take some time for questions. So if you have a question, let me know, and I'll bring the mic to you. Yeah. To prove the point about the flood, has anybody ever done a model, you know, uh, a smaller model of a flood? to show that they're laid down in succession like that real quickly? Actually, Michael Ord has been a good resource for that. He and there's two other geologists that are working on that. He has some very good stuff on the flood that anything you can get by Michael Ord will, uh, and it's very well written. Michael Ord is a wonderful writer. And um, it, it just explains things very, very well, very, very easily. And he's done a lot of that kind of work. And he lives in Montana. He lives in Montana, that's right, a fellow Montana. He lives over in Bozeman. That's uh, the Garden of Eden, I'm told. Actually, one of the, the best samples of uh, uh, you know, the recent flood is Mount St. Helens. It is, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, all of those layers they discovered were laid down rather quickly. A lot of ca a catastrophe took place at Mount St. Mount St. Helens. In fact, Mount St. Helens was used to change the view of many geologists in Yellowstone about the so-called petrified forest there. That was another one of those stumbling blocks for me as a kid, was to see that there were 40,000 years of successive forests there in Yellowstone. How could the Bible be true if there was 40,000 years of successive forests? And just recently here, I grabbed the latest copy of Roadside Geology of Yellowstone. Latest copy now, fresh print. And guess what it says? Mount St. Helens is the modern analog for explaining Yellowstone National Park. And so they no longer believe that it was over 40,000 years of successful forest, or successive forests. Um, okay, wow, that's loud. Uh, so I've been studying space recently in a school, and I realized that uh, the scarcity of stony meteorites also proves the Earth's age because um, scientifically by over, you know, research over the years um, and how many times the meteorites have come out that scientists have realized that uh, the scar sheet of it couldn't be that old because, as you said, over millions of years, um, how could there not be, you know, billions of meteorites? Yeah, well, that's a good point. And you notice, too, along with that, if you read some of the articles on the moon, 
and other planets, uh, geologists now are starting to begin that there was a period, are starting to believe that there was a period in geological history. Now it would be, in our terms, it would be uh, a few billion years ago, but in the age of the universe being about 15 billion years, it's, that's a relatively short period of time, that there was a huge, massive um, meteorite comet explosion. And now if we look at that and look in relation to the flood, we might think, well, you know what? During the flood, the, the heavens were affected. There's been a lot of research done on meteorite uh, explosion at the time of the flood, and that could line up real. It could line up very well. The, a lot of the uh, surfaces they have found these meteorite collisions on actually show some of the sides of the planets uh, and some of these other celestial bodies as being peppered more than the other side. And that would also indicate that it's been maybe a particular period in time, probably related to the flood, when all that happened. Question over here. Um, I was wondering, uh, you see rivers that stay the same all the time, build up silt and whatnot, and then, like the Grand Canyon, well, they say through the millions of years that it's carved out. I, I, I don't understand the difference there. Yeah, um, you don't understand the difference. Maybe I'd um, rephrase it again, would you? Um, what is the difference with one stream to another where one will, they'll say, carved out uh, the Grand Canyon through uh, long periods of time while, while other streams don't do that? I don't understand that. Well, a lot of the streams that we observe today move loose sediment and sands. In fact, they're shifting all the time. No rivers are are stationary. I, I did a, I have a kit. I don't have it here with me, but it's it's actually the uh, geology of the Lewis and Clark expedition. And in it, I've got several maps and photos of various rivers along the Lewis and Clark Trail that have radically changed their course, not carved canyons. But they changed their course through the years, so different maps had to be drawn, redrawn because of it. But they moved soft sediment. There's a great deal of difference between moving soft sediment and carving hard, hard limestone, sandstone, and granitic rocks. Those had to have been cut while they were pretty much still pliable and with a lot of force. Because the, the formation of the Grand Canyon was, they say it's about 70 million years ago, but the actual layers were being formed over uh, over a billion years. So those were all hard. The Colorado River, I don't know if you've been on it, there's not a whole lot of force in the Colorado River. I mean, rapids, a five on the rapids doesn't begin to, to carve the kind of uh, e erosion effects that receding floodwaters would have had. They would have ripped through semi-pliable strata and really scarred the earth. In fact, that's what it is. You get on top of the Grand Canyon there and you look down and it looks like a huge scar in the earth. The other thing about the Colorado River, I don't know if you notice this, is it flowing south and it abruptly flows west. It's very interesting. It cuts across five uh, fractures in the earth or, or small rifts. These are the, uh, faults. And it, water normally would cut through least resistance, but it cuts across those faults. And that's a real mystery, how it could have done that. Yeah. Um, another question back here. Yeah. Um, how do you spell Mike, Michael Ord's last name? O-A-R-D. Yeah, O-A-R-D. Okay, O-A-R-D. that's yeah. what I wanted to know. If you go on to Creation Ministries International website and you type in Michael Ord, you'll get, you'll get tons of writing. He is a prolific writer. And I have talked to him many, many times, had conversations with him. The guy is a real faithful guy. He, he doesn't know me from Adam. And every one of my emails that I've sent to him have been answered within two days. He's, he's just that kind of a person. So I would say anything you read by him would give you a good education. Yeah. You mentioned earlier that you meet with 800 to 1,000 students a year. Yeah. Um, Romans 1 tells us clearly that the truth is known to them. But they've been bombarded with a lie 
that is being told as fact. And I, I've often said if you tell a lie long enough, often enough, and something else, people loud enough, thank you, people will begin to believe it. And they're shouting this now. My question to you is, as you present this argument, how are they receiving it? Do you do? Are they saying, you know, I need to think about that, or are they just looking at you as a religious nut and they bought into the and they're blinded? Well, some of the some of the public school students do. I've had I give a lot of field trips to public schools, and they they warn me beforehand, don't mention any of this religious stuff. So usually toward the end of the field trip, I'll let them know that this end, officially ends the field trip. If you want to hear my explanation for these rocks, stick around here. And about 75 percent of the people do. And I think what I see is kind of a relief to know that there's a legitimate explanation out there. I, it's just, you know, it, religious people can be, they can appear to be wackos, you know, and a little strange. We are called peculiar, uh, you know, but visiting with us and seeing how level-headed we are, I, there's, it gives them, I think, some hope. And uh, now the kids being raised in Christian homes, uh, and and, uh, and being taught some more of the stuff, being exposed to it. What I'm hoping there is that there'll be a few grains of things that stick so that as they grow up, go through the same things I went through. My faith was challenged. There was a time there where I, I chucked it all. And uh, it was probably the, the, the most horrible time in my life in my relationship with my parents. In fact, my mother was the first one to witness to me. I came home from college one day. And she sat me down. She goes, you know, your dad and I get the impression that you're just home here to pick up the check for school. <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said, are you still going to church? And I said, no, I'm, I'm looking around. She, goes, she looked at me and she said, it's your soul. And she just got up and walked out of the room. That probably did more to... You know, I remember driving all the way back from uh, on the way to back to college, just think, hoping I wouldn't die in an accident because I knew I was going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but there's little grains of truth, I think, that you hope will just catch on. Yeah. How do evolutionists attempt to explain the elevation differences in the Grand Canyon? How the Colorado could enter at a lower elevation? than the middle of the canyon and then? Well, it's a real mystery. There, is, there are some things that geologists won't talk about in public. And the book's presented as if, boy, this is a signed, sealed, delivered statement of fact here. But behind closed doors, there's a lot of disagreement over these kinds of things. And there are a lot of mysteries. If you were to list the top 10 mysteries in modern geology, at the top of the list would be the Ice Age. That'd be the top of the list. Geologists today still can't figure out how we could have an ice age. It just it, it doesn't add up. You have some of the factors taking place here, but not here because this is what's needed. The flood answers it all. But the same way with the, the Colorado Plateau. The Colorado Plateau is kind of an enigma. After all, this sandstone that's supposed to form the Colorado Plateau, according to geologists, is supposed to have come all the way from Appalachia. How did it get there? That's another major mystery. But the differences in elevation is a major mystery, some of these things.